Welcome to Whole and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves, featuring conversations with special guests on topics related, but not limited to burnout, mindset, fulfillment, transitions, wellness, and so much more. I am your host, Jessica Locke, Astrala Yoga Guide and Holistic Wellness Coach. And this podcast is not about telling you what to do. I believe we all have the answers we need within. This podcast is here to inspire you, help you find clarity, and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. And of course, we'll be sharing tools and strategies from our guests to embrace your inner wisdom and live unleashed. Ready to dive in? Many of us who have started a business or just trying to fulfill any goal in general, we sometimes forget a very important component, which is including ourselves and our needs in the equation. When I first started my business, I was craving for freedom and the ability to choose what I wanted to work on. And then I ended up overworking myself. And yes, there's many layers to that, but one of the main one was because I didn't include my needs. I thought pushing was the only way to go. My guest today, Nikki McKnight, talks about running a successful business with bipolar 2 disorder and how she's created space to take care of herself, because it's certainly not one or the other. Nikki has over a decade of experience working with companies to improve processes, drive communication and performance, and build a rock star team. She's worked with multi-billion dollar retailers, million dollar entrepreneurs, and startup boutiques looking to start off on the right foot. Nikki loves working with the artistic, creative, and spiritual personalities because she truly believes they will be the ones who will change the world for the better. Nikki loves cycling, pop culture podcasts, romance novels, and hanging with her dog Riesling. In today's episode, Nikki shares how she became a back-end coach slash operations magician, the importance of having solid systems in your business so you can move through shiny object syndrome, on mental health, her experience with bipolar 2 disorder and how she takes care of herself, such as creating space and flexibility in her business that allows her to step back whenever she needs to and how you can do that as well on the false sense of urgency and why it's important to recognize when it's running the show, how she learned to streamline her business with the minimum effect dose inspired by a mentor of hers, and so much more. Come join our chat. Hi, Nikki. I'm so excited to have you here today. And we met a couple of years ago through a couple of serendipitous connections. I was like quitting my job, pivoting, and then somehow we ended up working together. And I've Mm. admired you ever since. And I, I haven't told you in person just because of your ability to synthesize any idea as you know, over the moon it is, but you can make it happen. You're like, oh yeah, let's just scale back and see what we can do. And you do that with any kind of idea. So I'm so excited to maybe get more out of it, see what your zone of genius is. And yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm so excited. This is just, you know, we were, we were talking beforehand. It's just like so nice to see people we haven't seen in a while and connect back with like people from different communities that we've been a part of. And I think like so important right now, especially yeah. to be connected with community. Um, but it's just like, it's so much fun. You're like, hi, yeah. it's so yeah. nice. <laughs> like it's a, I was telling her to get a hammock. <laughs> I know, yes. The important discussions were being had. <laughs> well, you have to be comfortable. That's my dream. It's True. too small for my apartment. So I convince other people to do it so I can live vicariously for them. <laughs> Perfect. I will buy a hammock and then just say, this is Jess's <laughs> hammock for when she visits. <laughs> That's so sweet. So tell us a little bit more about yourself. What's your, I guess, origin story if you were to put it together? Ooh, okay. So if Marvel was making a movie about my life and I was the next big superhero movie, um, I don't know, you know, small town girl from like an East Coast French fishing town leaves and moves around a lot uh, as a kid and just collects this really random and unique collection of experiences, um, you know, both work and living abroad and studying different things and trying different things to kind of just get to a point where 
I have almost like this bag of experiences and like magical tricks that I'm just like, how can I play with these today? So how I play with them right now is I'm a back-end business coach. I'm an operations consultant. Um, I Sometimes I refer to myself as an operations magician. You know, you are kind of going with the same. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, I, you know, working online for the last seven years and just working with really cool entrepreneurs who are doing really cool stuff and want to change the world and just need a little help to do it. And by operations, for those who don't understand, because I recently mm-hmm. learned what that word is, what what is it exactly? I think the simplest definition is. Um, you know, we often talk about front end or back end of businesses and front end is like that sexy stuff. It's the sales, it's the marketing, it's your social media that like everybody and their mother is doing a course on or selling coaching on. Um, I operate more in the back end. I'm people planning and process. I'm team, I'm systems, pretty much like I call it the foundational um, stuff that brings dreams to life that allows things to actually happen in a way that is in alignment, that is easy, that is sustainable, that you're not, you know, entrepreneurs, we wear a lot of hats and we juggle really, really well. So I help people, I'll say juggle more efficiently and only wear the hats when they want to wear the hats. Ooh, that's so good. You are definitely, when I first met you and the company you were working for, I saw you as the brain, like, you know, the magician, honestly, like anything, it's like, talk to Nikki, Nikki will make it happen. I'm like, how? I want to scan your brain. I don't know how to read brain scans, but I want to scan it. (laughs) I feel like it would be kind of interesting. Um, I'm curious myself. But yeah, I kind of jokingly said, like, I never really thought of myself as like a visionary or creative type person because I was always, you know, I was the smart nerd in school. Um, but, you know, people that I work with and people who I've worked for have had these like amazing visions, these amazing dreams. And it kind of, I kind of synced into this idea that, oh, you're the what and the why. I'm the how. Mm-hmm. And without the how, the what and the why can't come into existence because beautiful ideas without inspired action, they don't go anywhere. And that's horrible. We want ideas to go places. We want dreams to go places. So uh, yeah, I'm the how. I'm the how the things happen. Yeah, 100%. And how did you get into that role? How did you even find that? I think it's, I've always been like an analytical person as much as I was a creative, you know, I kind of rail against identity is, is a, something that's been interesting and exploration for me the last few years. Cause I was an actor. I was a writer when I was a kid, I did all these things, but then I got really into, you know, just figuring things out and having to juggle a lot of things. Like one of my first jobs out of university was in um, operations and logistics. So I managed global supply chain between like South Africa and North America. And I did no that for biggie. like six years. No biggie. <laughs> I did that for six years. I was running like, I think we were like a $25 million company at the time. I was like 24. And I just, you know, it was the skills I liked, which was just getting things done, getting through a lot of stuff, getting through a lot of data. But ultimately, like making sure that the things that were promised would happen actually happened. And I just got like, I liked it. I really, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of an introvert. So peopling for a long period of time is hard for me. I'm also a projector in human design, which means like, I need some breaks (laughs) from time to time. So I was never, I I worked in sales for a few years, but it was never my thing. I found it so draining, but I got really energized by the behind the scenes stuff, like the making things happen uh, kind of stuff. So I really got to kind of harness that skill and build those skills working in operations and logistics which you're 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 constantly balancing a million balls in the air and it's very time sensitive because you're working with perishable product and then you know you get super burnt out from that but you you're left with all these skills and you're like okay i can balance things i can juggle things i can plan for every eventuality that has to translate to something else right and luckily for me it did um Yeah, to get into more into working with online businesses, working in event production. I worked in theater production for a little bit. And, you know, it's all just behind the the making the stuff happen and making sure none of the glass balls in the air drop and shatter. Right. And you do it with so much calmness. Maybe because like, <laughs> I've never seen you kind of like frazzled or you, you've you seen people when they there's a lot going on and they can just kind of mm-hmm. move it. And they're like, yeah, mm-hmm. everything will figure it. That's how I see you. You're kind of like, yeah, it's going to happen. And I'm like, how does your brain hold all that information, all those people you're connecting with and making sure that all of the people down the chain are being taken care of? 
Well, I'm happy it looks calm because sometimes <laughs> it's definitely not. Um, yeah, it's one of those things like, you know, people talk about superpowers, people talk about their gifts or what they're really good at. I've just kind of come to realize that that's mine, being able to juggle things um, to memories, things. One of my favorite shows, like BBC's Sherlock, you know, with Benedict Cumberbatch and Martin Freeman, he refers to like a mind palace is how he remembers everything. And I, while I won't say I have a mind palace, it's more like a mind filing cabinet, really. Um, I've just, uh, you know, kind of organized my brain to see patterns and to see meaning rather than individual things. Because I think when you can really understand an outcome and understand what you're driving for, all the steps to get there, in my brain, at least they become obvious. There's no wondering like what the little steps have to be. Cause you're like, this is the ultimate thing that we're driving for. This is what we're looking for. So we can just align any resource, whether it's time, energy, people, money, whatever it is. They're just so connected to that outcome and the intention that was built with that outcome that it almost like it just cascades into being, I know, which is right, like a weird right. way to describe it, but. That makes so much sense. But do you ever get shiny object syndrome sometimes sometimes and I'll say it's it's usually fun when I'm in that mood and so are my clients because my clients definitely they have shiny object syndrome and sometimes That's I why. definitely do too yeah. yeah um you know the easiest answer for that is like a great system always helps to keep track of things you know I have project management systems so I always kind of know what I have to be working on and I try to block out my time efficiently so that I'm working on the most important things, but I'm also giving myself time to rest and I'm scheduling in time to, to plan for shiny object syndrome, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I almost have in my calendar, like unstructured time that that can, yeah. it can really mean anything. It can mean I write, it can mean I create a new offer. It can mean I, you know, I decide that I want to launch something. I don't know. I work on that. Or it could just be me. I'm going to sit on the couch and play video games yeah. because I've created space and nothing is so urgent that it can't wait an hour just so I can go play Animal Crossing or something. Yeah. <laughs> and also just let your brain rest because I, yeah. I love how you share about being introvert, projector, human design. I can relate to all of that. And I think mm -hmm. when I was a designer or so when I design, I'm very back end. I'm comfortable. I don't need to take up space. But once I started my own business, for me, it was so daunting to have to take up space and then it's like, oh, be front end. How was the transition for you now that it you're was, starting your own business? It was hard when I transitioned. Like I've had my own business for like seven years now, but I was always, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd start working with clients and eventually just go work for them full time. So it was constantly like in and out. So I was always kind of this backstage role and I was really comfortable with that. And I, I even remember saying to, to one of my, my bosses at the time, yeah, I'm totally cool being backstage. I don't want to be on stage, which yeah. again, I laugh at because I was an actor like for 10 years and through right. college, university, which was always just a weird transition. But I remember coming back to my own company um, just over a year ago and being like, all right, this is it. This is, this is my direction. This is my path for at least right now. So everything is kind of on, on me to succeed or to fail, whatever this is going to look like. It's on me. I have to be front of stage. And it was the hardest thing for me was just talking. And speaking about the industry, speaking about what I thought entrepreneurs could do, like even things like giving like an Instagram trick was really hard for me because I, I was constantly thinking, is this me saying this because I believe it and I think it's the best? Or is this me parroting what I've been told the last years or how I've seen other people run their businesses and I'm just modeling that, you know, we often see this in entrepreneurs who leave like a corporate environment, they leave corporate and, you know, I did the same thing because they don't, they won't run things a little bit differently. They want to, you know, focus more on culture and alignment and vision and values. They want to do all these things, but because they've come from that environment, they unconsciously start recreating those exact same patterns in their own work and they don't even realize they're doing it and then after a while they're like i'm working 60 hours a week this is why i left corporate right so i kind of had that that for probably the first three months of being back running my own business you know i was overbooked working way too much i was doing all these things that i thought i had to be doing because you see all those people out there going oh you have to have a course you have to do a mastermind you have to do group coaching you have to do this and i was just like oh my goodness and i was just so focused on making it work that I was trying everything 
And I kept, you know, I kind of just had this own realization a few months in going, why the heck am I doing this? This is why I left my last job. Mm -hmm. So why am I trying to run my life and my business like somebody else would? That makes no sense. Because otherwise I would still be working for someone else. Without the headache. Because the money will just, you know, you will get paid without trying to like hustle for more money and any of that too. Yeah, that was also fun because I left my job like two weeks before the Canadian border shut down because of the pandemic. Um, So going from like a really good salary to zero, um, then a global pandemic was really hard. You know, I took government assistance money for about two months and I was like, I felt there was some guilt associated with that, that it was like, oh, Mm -hmm. this is proof that it's not working, that you Mm -hmm. have to go take government assistance just to pay your bills. But I was like, no, like this is me investing time and energy in whatever way possible to make this work. Um, And I was really lucky that I had built up these amazing communities of people that, you know, I had a good referral network. I had Mm -hmm. people who already kind of knew what I did. So in the very base sense, it wasn't really a hard sell to get the ball rolling. So at least started, um, Mm -hmm. which was definitely something I'm very grateful for that, you know, I I don't, I didn't have to take government assistance that long. The business was very successful in its first year and we're only growing, but it really took some time to be, who do I have to be and how do, who do I have to show up as? in order to be both the front end and the back end person in this business so that it does what it's supposed to do. It serves its purpose. It makes me happy. It brings in money, all of these things. Yeah. It definitely was a bit of a change, but ultimately I'm exactly where I want to be. Oh, that was so powerful, especially because I think at the beginning, when we leave corporate, we think we have all the tools, we feel that excitement and we know we can do it. But there's so much, I guess I'll call it inner work of like, okay, Mm -hmm. what am I trying to do? What am I trying to accomplish? And very similar to you, I took all the beliefs from agency and I brought it to my own business Mm -hmm. and I was burning out all the time. I'm like, I'm out of that burnout environment. These are my deadlines. Why am I burning up? So I really had to understand that. And part of my healing surrender, because I was getting sick all the time. I was out of this environment. I was better, but I was always in the healing stage. Like, what am I doing wrong? So really realizing mm-hmm. that aligning your business to you, just because you learn a course or what everybody's doing, mm-hmm. does it feel right to you? Even you sharing the idea of like recording videos and the discernment between, is it something I want to do? And mm-hmm. it, it feels a little bit uncomfortable at first or because I'm being told to. So how do you now with all that practice, how do you find the middle? I think discernment is such a great word for it. And it's a word that uh, several of my coaches have used a lot. So I think, but when, when it comes to the, the act of discernment, it's always like, well, what are you asking yourself so that you can discern your path, right? You're just like, have discernment. Well, that's yeah. all well and good, but what does it actually mean? Um, yeah. And I can't remember, I saw this online I can't remember. It might have been maybe Hannah Deindorfer posted this on her Instagram. Um, and it really resonated with me because especially um, like co- people in the conscious entrepreneurship space, we talk about alignment and alignment is all well and good. But if we take alignment at face value, what we're really doing is we're aligning with our current patterns, not where we want to be going, because you can find safety in your patterns. You can find you know, there's, we all want safety and security. It's a part of our, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You need to have psychological safety. So oftentimes we'll say that we're doing things that are in alignment with us, but what they really are is they're in alignment with your current self. And it could be a self that you are trying to shed. So instead, when it comes to discernment and, and really understanding your path or your actions, your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, all these things, it really has to come from a place of, Yes, alignment, but alignment with the the thing that you want to be, the self that you want to be and not where you are right now, because things are going to be uncomfortable. I think a lot of people think about alignment as that as that which is easy. But if you're truly growing, alignment isn't always going to be easy because you want to be growing. You want to be evolving as a human. You want to be evolving as a business owner. So I think when we talk about discernment and alignment, that's really the biggest realization I've had is it cannot be aligning with myself right now because then I'm not moving. 
Every decision I make is keeping me where I am, even if where I am is a good place. Instead, we have to be thinking about alignment with where we're going. Who do I want my future self to be? Where do I want my business to be in the future? Like if you really wanted to, you could say, what is my three-year goal? Well, who do I have to be to make that happen? I'm not that person right now, because if I was that person, I'd be there right now. So I know I'm not. So for me, that's the biggest thing is alignment and discernment are amazing. I think it's how you kind of have to lead your business. But I think we need to realize that when you ask ourselves, well, this feels in alignment to me. Yeah, maybe it feels in alignment to you right now, mm -hmm. but it's going to keep you where you are. So we have to get a little bit uncomfortable. Yes. I think grow. oftentimes alignment is uncomfortable because I think one of my coaches shared how alignment is always changing. So maybe mm -hmm. what you need right now, exactly where you are helps, but you have to, you you grow out of it eventually and you mm -hmm. have to change with it. But I think yeah. we might still grab onto an alignment from five years ago. That's not mm -hmm. working. And we think it worked before. So why is it working exactly. now when the new alignment is like, no, you kind of have to dig in into mm -hmm. the scab a little. <laughs> yeah. Just a little bit. Just, yeah. Just a little yeah bit. One of my friends, um, John Romanello, who's a, who's a writing mentor, when we talk about say, even sales pages, I think there's a metaphor that we can talk about. You want to poke, not stab. <laughs> you're talking about, you know, sales pages, we talk about, oh, you have to have pain points and challenges. And there's a way to weaponize that in a way that's not really, I'd say, in, of the conscious space. So I really like when he says you need to poke it, not stab it. And I think alignment is very much the same when you're talking about actions and decisions that you're undertaking that you want to poke yourself. You don't want to stab yourself because yeah. then you're going to be like, I'm never going to go do that again. Like that is painful. But, you know, to use your pick, pick the scab a little bit, we want, we want to poke it. <laughs> you want to be poking yourself just a little bit because that's where the transformation is going to come from. That's so true. And also when you're, if you're trying to, you know, share your services, your packages, sell it because you are a business, you're a conscious business. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to poke at the pain points, like you said, but not mm -hmm. re-traumatize people. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, we talk about bro marketing or however you want to describe bro marketing, what that actually means. But that's, I think we've seen a, uh, not a full shift in that away from the the stabby stabby, like, don't you just hate yourself? Um, <laughs> infomercials. Like, yeah, like the infomercial kind of thing. Uh, I think it, it's, I think it's most prevalent probably in the weight loss and fitness community. Like, don't you just hate yourself when you look in the mirror? How about we talk about like improved energy, like better sleep, mood, all these things, you know, and we could go into this whole other discussion about like, you know, like the ableism and, and, and the, the racist attitudes of all these things. But really, again, what it comes down to is how using that discernment, using that alignment and really focusing on transformation rather than like, um, what's the... I like to say an, it's an evolution. You're, it's like, you know, it's like in Pokemon, the whole poke, you're not changing into a different Pokemon. You're, you're, you're evolving oh, into a different yeah. one. So I really like evolution better than, you know, transformation. I, I'm not a huge fan of transformation because to me, that's, you're going, you're going from one thing to the other. And I'm like, right. well, what was wrong with me in the first place that I have yeah. to change, that I have to transform. So I personally like evolution better because I'm just, I'm, I'm evolving into yeah. my next being or I'm ascending up into this it's a nice oh, visual to see yes. I'm ascending I'm up into that. my next being there you yeah, go <laughs> I, I love that so much I might borrow it I'll go <laughs> be, like <laughs> be like a Pokemon be like a Pokemon so that everybody wants to find you <laughs> exactly because you got to catch them all Pokemon. exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah. oh my gosh how has your experience been with I know you you share a little bit on social media how you're learning to balance your business also with mental health and with days mm -hmm. that you're feeling tired. How has mm -hmm. that journey been for you? That's been a whole other level to my to, to my growth. I'll say um, I have bipolar uh, two disorder, um, so it mostly affects my mood, my energies, highs and lows. Uh, I'm my normal is that I'd say a lower than most uh, people is kind of like my normal state. And I can go in between, you know, depression, but also like mania where I'm just like 
dropping a ton of money on random things on Amazon and like super vibing with all these people. Like hypomania is a little bit of a weird state. So I don't have any shame or anything around it. Like every, all of my clients know, my friends know, as you said, I've talked about it on social media before. It's just, it's just a part of who I am. It is challenging though, when you're a business owner, especially when you, you're a service-based business like I am, that you kind of have this mental story that I can't talk about this because I could be seen as incompetent. I could be seen as not being able to do my job. It could be seen, you know, as, as all these things. And, you know, I'm going through that right now. I'm currently changing medications and adjusting certain things. And that's been tough the last, you know, six to eight weeks that I've been going through that process because it really is affecting my moods and my energy. Um, and all I've done is I've, you know, you have to be as transparent as you feel safe being with people. Cause I think understanding and compassion, all the people that I work with have that. So, you know, I don't really have any shame or guilt about sharing that with my clients, because if I didn't feel comfortable sharing that, then I shouldn't be working with them in the first place. But I'm very lucky that, you know, they are good, empathetic people. But the second part of that is you kind of have to build a business that allows you to uh, create distance, to create space when you need it so that you can heal and feel better and take time for yourself and take care of yourself first. Because again, that's, that's the reason so many of us start our own businesses is we want to be able, we want to be accountable for our own time and how we spend it. So it's taken practice. I definitely didn't do it the first few months I had my business because I was, you know, again, overbooked and overworked and not sleeping and all these things. But I think it all comes back to this ideas of, of outcomes and they're how I work with my clients as well, that nothing that we do is so urgent very rare exceptions that it has to happen now like nothing is so immediate we get caught up in the sense of false urgency that we have to be juggling all things all the time but if we can use this idea of outcomes and we can you know a good plan always helps if you're far enough out in advance you have a little bit more flexibility with time mm -hmm. um but if we're focused on the outcome then it really shouldn't matter how it happens as long as it happens in the way that we need it to. So I get really explicit with my clients about deadlines and things. Um, they can always see what I'm working on and when I'll have it done by. And I just know that if it's not due until Friday and I'm having an off day today, mm -hmm. I can do it tomorrow. And having a little bit of grace with myself that my worth as a human, my worth as someone who is working with my clients is not totally dependent on my ability to respond to something in less than 10 seconds. That is super helpful because, again, it, it gets rid of this sense of false urgency that, again, maybe it's a carryover from corporate and this kind of super hyper masculine kind of work environments that many of us have been trained in to just be like, no, 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 no. Things have to happen now. And it's like, no, do they really? Can they wait? Can they be done later? Um, and one of my good friends said to me once, well, I was saying to him that I was feeling guilty about taking a vacation or a few days off. And he goes, if you're good at your job then the result should be that you create space. Your systems are so, you know, you should be so good that you can take time away. Like that's what you help people do. So why would you punish yourself for being good at your job because you've created space and time? And I went, oh, wow, this is like complete self-flagellation that I'm doing right now. This is really interesting. <laughs> yeah, so it definitely, it, it takes practice. It doesn't always work. I've definitely dropped deadlines, missed deadlines when I've been in a low, but... I think communication always wins in the end and having people that you can rely on to help, you know, whether that's building my own team, whether that's leaning on the people on my client's team and asking for help, all of those things um, kind of create that support network, create that supportive environment in which the work still gets done. Yeah. So if it still gets done then and it's done the right way, then it shouldn't really matter. Mm -hmm the manner in which it gets done. Yeah. And it, I, first of all, I want to appreciate you for being so transparent and open about this for, you know, sharing the experience because it has to be talked about. We push and shove so much. And we think that if we don't show up in our business, it's not going to be successful. If we, you know, take a break, even when we've been doing a good job, it feels like we're not showing up and it's, all those stories we've attached to and being able to, you know, be one, you know, more open about it. I think that will inspire more people to mm -hmm. 
you know, live more for your lives because what you're doing right now, setting systems with your experience to be able to step away whenever you need it, that's honoring yourself. And it's easy to tell people, you know, go honor yourself, kind of like the, mm-hmm. the sermon, but it's not yeah. that easy. What is self-care? No. You don't just go take a bubble bath. No, this is so <laughs> complicated. It's, yeah. you know, you have to kind of give up the stories of what you think you should be as well. Mm-hmm. So that kind of gives people permission to really, lean onto how they're feeling and it's scary Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. seeing someone like you who you know have an amazing business and you're so honest and transparent even with your clients about how you're doing I think that gives people permission because I feel like very inspired just by listening to that well thank you yeah are you ready to create space for ease and alignment I've created a free starter guide to help you go from frazzle to focus It's a guide for the overwhelmed go-getter who's eager to find more ease, clarity, and alignment in their lives, so you can quiet the noise and strengthen your connection within. After all, we can't align what we don't know is misaligned. Simply grab your free copy at wholeandunleashed.com slash guide. Yeah, I think that, to me, that's the definition of culture. When we talk about, I want to, I want to be culturally aligned with the people I work with or the people I have on my team. Um, to me, that's culture. Culture isn't like we have a keg in the office on Fridays or we have free food or it's like an unlimited time off. That's that's window dressing. That's not actually culture. Yeah. Culture is a shared vision that everybody is aligned behind and they know exactly how they contribute because then that's when you you feel energized and inspired in how you show up and you get people's hearts and minds and only when you have hearts and minds together can you actually make things happen in a in a in a good way in a non-pressured way in this you know i'll use the word aligned in this beautifully aligned way like that's the 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 trick to that so if you can put that in everything that you do it relieves a lot of the pressure to show up and i think People who weren't prepared for that have definitely been, you know, during this pandemic and maybe their entire business moved online or maybe they had an office before and they weren't used to remote working. I think that's one of the biggest lessons you can take away from this is to have grace with the time and to just be focused on outcomes and intention because people have kids at home. They aren't in school and they're having to do that. And maybe they're also a caregiver and they're trying to run a home, a home based business and they have kids at home and their clients are doing this. And, you know, all these things are happening that if we stuck to you must be available nine to five and this is what happened, nothing would get done. And there you have a stressed out workforce who wasn't completing things, wasn't performing, wasn't showing up the way they needed to because life was happening. Mm. So having that space allows life to happen just as much as business to happen in a way that feels better for everybody. Yeah. And it's funny because we often think that work or business need to consume all it's our life when it's not, it's just Mm -hmm. life and you get to do work business, however it is. And I think even now, like people are hitting another wall because Mm -hmm companies don't have proper culture and systems to set up other than Mm -hmm. oh we're meeting every day on zoom calls but are people connecting are you asking about how you're doing and you also really good at that like when we were working together I was a freelancer but I felt included you kept me in the loop of things which was like Mm -hmm. it felt less isolating Mm -hmm. yeah yeah definitely important even more so now (laughs) Yeah. And well, you're also growing your team. How has that Mm -hmm. process been? You talk about streamlining your business a lot Mm -hmm. in what you share. So Mm -hmm. what is streamlining? How do you do it? (laughs) (laughs) Um, To to borrow a phrase from one of my mentors, Alex Sharpen, he has something called minimum effective dose. And it's pretty much like, what is the, the the minimum you need to be effective? And let's just focus on that. Like, let's not add in extra. Let's not do, you know, all these things. And a lot of times people think about that when it comes to like software. Like, what is your tech stack? How many redundancies do you have or not have? Or like, I need all of these things to do all these things. And none of them talk to each other. So it's super redundant. It's very, very manual. Uh, so I kind of look at streamlining in three different ways. Like we, you streamline your brain. How do you know when to, where to focus your energy and what are some practices that you can kind of put into your day, your week, your, your time to keep you energized, to keep you focused so that you know what you're supposed to be juggling and when, so you can kind of 
empty out the extra stuff from your brain until you need it. I like to think about it as you're categorizing all the balls that you're juggling and then you, you put them down and you only pick them up when you need to. So kind of getting your brain organized and having a place where you can kind of I'll see, brain dump stuff that comes mm-hmm. up and you know how it's handled. Because once your brain is streamlined, you've created space that you can be creative, that you can be energized about, then you can focus on streamlining your business. You know, coming up with the plan, setting those goalposts or milestones that you're working towards, really getting clear on your vision for one, three, five years, six months, who knows what it is, but really kind of understanding what the road is and then putting in some guardrails. So you have all the freedom in the world to play in between those guardrails. So you're satisfying that need for change or shiny object syndrome, but you have the guardrails in place to keep you from going too far off track. Um, and then once you've streamlined the business and you understand the path and the rail, then you can move into things like streamlining your team, streamlining your tech stack, um, all those fun back end system stuff that most entrepreneurs really don't like dealing with. But you you now have something to kind of guide them against. And I've, I've spent a lot of time in my career hiring people and training people. So when it came time to do my own team, I was I was totally fine. I was like, yeah, of course, I'm going to hire someone to help. So yeah it's it's been good um it's and it also really challenges you again to grow because you'll realize one you can't keep doing everything that you're doing because it's exhausting and you start thinking about i don't want to do this anymore i'm going to hire a a va or i'm going to hire a a tech person to do all this stuff but it also really kind of trickles down to everything else that you know i have a va who who helps me with some stuff but right now i don't have a lot of stuff for her to do and i was like oh because all my services are currently set up that i'm 100 percent responsible for delivery <sighs> so that, then i'm like okay well now i need to interrogate my own programs and services to see if there's things i can take myself out of that i could utilize her more on because she's ready willing and able to help and i was like interesting mm-hmm. so you know currently doing a deep dive into my offers to see does this actually need to be this way and if it does cool. Like if that's, if that's the way I want to work right now, that's great. I'll go with it. But it kind of gives you an opportunity to go into this, this idea of discernment and being like six months from now, is this still going to work for me Yeah. and figure that out? And, you know, and it also forces you to, you know, when you're growing a team, you start confronting again, the, the story of identity in that you don't have to be everything to everyone. Like I'm pretty mm-hmm. good at tech. I'm pretty decent, but then I started getting a lot of questions about, oh, can you link this and this and convert kit and Kajabi and all these platforms I don't really use? And I was like, yeah, and I would spend so much time Googling it and trying to figure it out so that I could be the person who knew how to do it. And now I'm just like, uh, I have somebody who does that. And I have someone who's really good at Kajabi and convert kit that I was like, hey, are you busy? I've got some work for you. Do you want it? And she's like, yeah, I'll take it. And I was like, fantastic. I'll project manage and off you go. So it was good for both of us and the project got done. So when you start hiring a team, it also, you know, not only do you really have to confront, you know, literally your business, what are your offers? How are you delivering things? Where are you the bottleneck? Where are you getting in the way of progress and growth? Getting in your own way. Yeah. Getting in your own way, but also, you know, you have to confront your identity and you don't need to be all things to everyone. And we talk about zone of genius and zone of excellence and all these things, but what do they actually mean? that's when you figure it out. Mm. That's so true. Playing. I'm at that stage that I'm learning to delegate. I know eventually I have to. Mm-hmm. And I, I think last year I had to work through the stories of why it felt so hard for me to do it because I felt like growing up, I was told that if you want anything done properly, you have to do it yourself. Yeah. And that stuck with me. It stuck with me mm-hmm. through group projects, through like even at my corporate job, I was like, I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to, mm-hmm. for what? The cost was my sanity yeah, <laughs> and my <definitely>. health. <laughs> yeah. And it's also, I think for me, I'm learning to trust that whoever I work with or, you know, invite into my team, they will be able to do it. Not maybe mm-hmm. not my way, because my way doesn't mean it's the only way. That's mm-hmm. also something that I'm like, oh, okay, be ready for it. Yeah. And I think that's something that stops actually a lot of my clients from hiring people is they're like, well, I have to know how to do it before I can hire someone. Because that was, how do I train them? And I was like, no, 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 no. You need to know <laughs> what the outcome is. You need to know, like, I don't know how to build a funnel. I, I kind of understand some of the basics, but I can't actually build a funnel. And this happened with 
one of my clients this past week. She wanted to build a new funnel. And I was like, great. Talk to me about the outcome of this funnel. Where do you want to go? What journey do you want to hit? What is the what is the 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 evolution you want the people to have from start to end of this funnel? Great. Okay, so I can come pull out some strategic bullet points. I took that document, I turned to the te our tech VA, and I said, you know how to use click funnels, right? She's like, Yeah. I said, Great, here's the strategy plan. How should we build it? And she came back and gave us a whole funnel map and said, this is going to be a bump and this is going to be a tripwire and we need like a six email nurture sequence and da, 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 da. And I said, fantastic. Let's do that. That's amazing. And it was so easy. It was so easy. I didn't have to be like, oh my gosh, well, that first there has to be a sales page and then we're going to have to do this. And then somehow we're going to get money from them. And then we're going to do, we're going to try to upsell them or something. Like, it's like the no. balls are just adding. You're not decreasing I was like, your balls. No, this, this is not a McDonald's like play place <laughs> ball pit from like the nineties. We're not getting into that situation, <laughs> but you really get to say, this is just what I want to have happen. And the, you know, the more specific you can be with that, always the better. It's hard to go to someone and say, I want more leads. Like, what does that actually mean? Um, yeah. But if you can go to someone and say, I'd like more qualified leads that meet this criteria that are brought into my universe in this way, properly nurtured and pre-qualified. So by the time they get on the phone with me, I'm not selling them on the program. I'm merely coaching through objections. Oh, you can say that to someone. It's like, oh yeah, fantastic. I got to think for that. Right. It's also Rather asking trying, the yeah. right questions. Yeah. So mm -hmm. when clients come to you, are you do you so in a way you actually coach them too you by asking the questions of what they want because so many mm -hmm. times they don't know the details of what they want and need mm -hmm. they just want yeah. it to be successful what does that mean yeah what does exactly. success mean for everyone yeah it's definitely it's a process and we you know there's no one size fits all most of the time to kind of figure out what it is right but we get to have you know it's it's an exploration it's experimentation it's play i think most people you know to use the funnel example or like i need a funnel <laughs> like, can we, can we play with this a little bit? Like, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this because if you can, if you can go into something, for example, like a funnel, which, you know, it's like, oh, it's tech back end, man, and it does these things. But if you can go into it with like a sense of play and thinking about the experience and the journey and how that's going to support your goals, how it's going to get you closer to that future state that you want, it's going to help you evolve into your next iteration. That's way more fun to talk about than tripwires and bumps and like down sells and upsells and abandoned carts and whatever is like th those are merely the tools of the vision it's not actually the yes. vision so the clearer we can get on that vision and how it fits into your universe and the narrative of how it fits into our universe like what's the mm -hmm. story that's so much more fun to do yes and it's, it's else so less that. overwhelming too yeah have you ever have people using too many tools that are not integrated <laughs> A lot, a lot of the time. Um, and honestly, it, it kind of become it, it comes out of, you know, when you're first starting, you're, most people have to bootstrap right away because there's there's no revenue in the company. It's not like unless you come from, you know, immense financial privilege, you can't just start a business one day and hire a full team to say this is what we're going to do from the very beginning. It's not realistic. But you can, you know, you do some research, you say, oh, a lot of people use this. And I think I need an email marketing software and I need something to keep track of my to-do lists. And so you kind of bootstrap some stuff together and that's fine. At the, you know, when you're first starting out, most people's main concern is what am I selling and how do I sell it? And then how do I deliver it? And if that's all you're thinking about, totally cool. You don't have to have fully built out XYZ and a massive lead generation engine and free courses and lead. You don't need to have any of that. It's really at the beginning. What, what's the minimum effective dose going back to that idea to, to get you what you need. Uh, and then over time, you can start finessing it. Um, over time, you can start changing things. But I think at the end of the day, like you need something to communicate to your team with, you need something to communicate to your clients with, you need something to deliver your product and you need something to track what you're doing. If all you have is those four things, you're fine. Can you make it better? Probably more efficient. A lot of the software now are coming out with automations and things to make things easier to make apps talk to each other so much easier. But you know, if you just have those four things, you can do pretty much anything and get yeah. at least enough awareness to where the sticky parts are that then you can with intention, with deliberateness, go just try to fix the sticky parts. And maybe that means you get a different software, but yeah. You want to get things streamlined. Like one of my friends, 
his dream in life for his business is he wants to run it from a desert island with only his cell phone. He's like, I don't even want to need, a, I don't want to want a laptop to run my business. I want apps on my cell phone. I was like, yeah, you can do that. You don't need to have massive things as long as you communicate to your team, communicate to your clients, deliver your product, uh, and keep track of what you're doing. Yeah, it can be done from your cell phone. That's so it. Keep it have simple. To be super complicated. Oh, exactly. I love that. That's such great advice, especially for people that are starting out. I think. There is so many courses online that are amazing, but it can also make you feel like you don't know enough. What you're doing mm -hmm. is not enough. And then mm -hmm. it takes so much focus around, away from your offering and what you're here to do. Mm -hmm. I was there, I, I think I was there, I wanted to start my health and wellness business three years ago. And then I got dragged into design and it was comfortable, it was making good money, mm -hmm. so I stay there. And I realized I didn't really fully pivot it because I felt like I was never enough. I wasn't an expert mm -hmm. compared to yeah. X, Y, Z. I didn't need those programs. I didn't have like mm -hmm. automation. All those words that are supposed to help me grow mm -hmm. were keeping me stuck. Mm -hmm. And then once I peeled everything back and just said, what am I here to do other than just yep. trying so hard? And then mm -hmm. everything made more sense and it started clicking and flowing like you shared. Yeah. You can always yeah. add on to it later too. Yeah you're not going to have a fully formed, perfect business from day one. Like look at children, babies aren't, you know, born <laughs> able to walk or feed themselves. They, they have to learn, they have to fail. They have to learn problem solving. And it's going to be the same way whenever you start a new project or business. Again, we get caught. I think we get caught up in the stories of highlight reels and, you know, celebrity entrepreneurs and influencers and how this is sunshine and rainbows and all these things. I was like, no, can we experiment? Can we play? Can we suck? Are we yes. allowed to do that? We are allowed to do that. Um, Cause that's when you really learn what you actually want. That's what I had to do when I first started. When I went back to this business last year, I came up with this amazing offer and I was like, yeah, this, this gets me some time freedom. I think it will get results. It will do X, Y, Z. Fantastic. Launched it, hated it. It sucked. I canceled it. Cause I was like, you know what? This is not actually helping anybody. And I just moved on to the next thing. I was like, it was an experiment. This worked, this didn't retooled yeah. it, launched it in a new thing. Now it's great. Yeah. So just... And being able to let it go. I admire that. Mm -hmm. I think because people think in quotation quitting is bad when it's not, yeah. you just know it's mm -hmm. not working for you. Yeah. You have to release from the outcome or release from like the expectation of the outcome. Mm -hmm. And I still struggle with that. Cause I'm like, it has to be good. If it's yeah. not good, then who am I? You know, what am I doing? <laughs> I lose everything. And I hate to use the quote, I think it's like Thomas Edison tried to make a light bulb and like failed 10,000 times. It's so trite, it's so overworked and we need to think about it. We need to remember that. But again, it is true because you, you learn something every single time and not every failure is like a catastrophic end of the world failure. Like a failure could be, oh, I sent the wrong email. I'm going to fix that for next time. The automation was wrong. It's sent to the mm. wrong people. Yeah. Like super like, oh God, I can't believe this happened. What'd you, what'd you learn from it? <laughs> add in and this to your automations cool now it works yes like can we talk about failure because i think we've mm -hmm. put so much weight on what failure means mm -hmm. that sometimes when we hit that point it's not as one bad as we think mm -hmm. and then two we can also spiral for a very long time but it's mm -hmm. just another stone that we had to step mm -hmm. And I think one of the things I've struggled because you know, in school, I was like, you know, I was the high achieving straight A honor roll student that if I wasn't that I was like, what, who am I, if not the smart one, it was very <laughs> weird to have to deal with that. Um, but then, you know, you fail at things and you can, again, you can fail small, you can smit, you can fail big, but I just started asking myself, like, what is the worst thing that can happen? Is that okay with me? And if, you know, if, if it's not okay, like, you know, if I, if all, if my business shut down tomorrow, what's the worst that could happen? Well, I have to take out a loan or I have to, you know, run up my credit card a little bit to pay for stuff, or I have to do X, Y, Z. What could I do? I could sell my house. Totally extreme. I could sell my house. I could go work at Starbucks. Like, and I'm like, could I live with those things? Yeah. They might suck, but I could live with them. Right. Yeah. And then you could, you start telling, well, other people are going to think I'm a failure. And I was like, well, what are you projecting onto others? And one of my, one of my coaches told me, uh, I can't remember exactly how she said it, but this idea that when you project onto others, what you are actually, you are robbing them of their experience 
without their permission, without their, you know, you're robbing them of their ability to experience you and your actions, mm -hmm. which essentially you're, you know, you're taking away from them. You're robbing them without their permission. Why would you do that? It's like, ha, ah, I don't want to be like non-consensually robbing people <laughs> of their experiences and emotions. Because like, I remember thinking when I, when I quit my last job, I didn't tell my parents for like three months that I had done it. Um, cause you know, I have a really close relationship with my parents and anytime I mentioned being unhappy at my job, they're like, yeah, but you make really good money and you get to work from home. Uh, nobody, nobody makes more than a hundred thousand dollars working from home. And I was like, I'm on first name basis with at least a hundred people that do interesting. So when I finally told them that, by the way, I gave my notice two months ago and next week is my last week, <laughs> they had a, they had a moment where they were like, oh my gosh, like why? But then the next day they're like, no, you're right. It's totally the right move for you. And I was like, so I was like, oh, I was projecting all my shit onto my parents for how they would can, react. That is so, so fast. I can relate it. to you. Yes, mm -hmm. because when I quit my corporate job, it, the hardest part of quitting was telling my parents. That yeah. was so hard. I thought it was going to be the end of it all because I fought for this career, didn't think I could make mm -hmm. it. I made it. I hated it. So now yep. I'm going to tell them. I, I, and then my mom's like, you're young. You don't have kids. So yeah, like if you're going to experiment, might as well try it out. I'm like, excuse me, who are you? Like, why are you telling me? <laughs> that it threw me off completely. But it was also like, like you said, I projected. I assumed that's what she's going to think of me, that I failed, mm -hmm. that I sucked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, that is so powerful. Yep. Thank you for sharing that. It was, it was a big so one for me that I was like, oh, I'm robbing people of their experience by assuming how they're going to react or assuming how they're going to handle something or keeping things from them that maybe I shouldn't be keeping from them. And I was like, yeah. oh, damn. <laughs> You're making me think <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Am I really, sometimes I don't tell my parents certain things because I'm like, they will be okay once I, I do it. I do the thing mm -hmm. and then I'm, I'm successful so mm -hmm. I don't have to worry that them yeah. in the process because they get mm -hmm. worrier so I'm like I might as well just tell them everything's okay but then yeah. you know a relationship you should be able to tell all these things too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you for that I'm still like digesting it all <laughs> <laughs> what are some you've shared like the four basic things that entrepreneur you know the basic if mm -hmm. they are trying to grow their business what are some other advice you have for anyone who might be stuck in their business or they want to scale or they want to hire. I know I'm asking you a lot. <laughs> Ooh, that's a good one. Cause I hate the answer. It depends. Um, <laughs> that's a great question. One of the things I've tried, like, so if I get stuck in my business and when I'm stuck, everything stops. Um, you know, the, the, the energy stops, the inspiration stops. And like, there's no growth. There's nothing exciting happening. We're not trying anything new. And sometimes that's nice. It's nice to just, let's just focus on what we're doing right now. We're not going to do anything else. Let's just, let's just hang here for a bit. We're going to catch our breath and we're going to keep going. Um, but sometimes when I'm stuck with a problem, the thing that's always really helped me is to almost like preemptively come up with solutions. So for example, I might want to launch a group program later this year. I've never launched a group program myself before. I'm a little nervous about it, but I'm like, I think it could really help people. So what I'm doing with that is I'm, I've been creating a list of what are all the problems that could come up during this process? What are all the stories I could tell myself on this journey? And what am I going to do if it happens? So I'm literally creating like, like a psychic list of, I am going to start feeling that nobody will want to buy this. Well, what am I going to tell myself to, to change that? Or I'm worried that I don't have the skills to do this. Well, what can I do to change that? So I'm preemptively solving problems by creating kind of like this list, putting these tools in my toolbox that I might need so that when I get there, I'm not as shocked by them. I'm not as surprised by them. Like this is familiar. I think I've dealt with this before, even though I haven't, I've, I've already pre-identified some solutions so I can be like, Oh, yeah, I'm really feeling like nobody's going to buy this thing. I'm going to pull out this little handy dandy list. Oh, this is not a measurement of me or my worth. Interesting. Oh, I could try doing a masterclass uh, and, you know, partnering with some affiliates to, to welcome people to this, to show my work. Huh, 
I could also do like these 10 things. So when I even like when I get stuck, I do the same thing, even if it's in the moment, like what are all the things I could do to move this forward or to get out of it, even if they're completely ridiculous, um, just to kind of get them out there and get the creative juices and the energies flowing again, because then once I got that energy and got that flow, then I can actually make things happen. But if I'm, you know, really on top of things, I preemptively do it before I even do something. I'm like, oh, I want to say I want to start a podcast. What are all the things or the, that could come up or the stories I could tell myself about a podcast? Boom. There you go. There's my, there's my brain dump list. I want to do a new program. I'm going to do this, or I'm going to launch a mastermind. I'm going to, here's all the stories I could tell myself. So you're almost arming yourself beforehand mm, with anything I that comes up. That. I love that because you're also, you're recognizing the energy block. Mm -hmm. and maybe the source of the blocks are the fears and the resistance, you're giving them space and you're mm -hmm. also soothing it mm -hmm. in a way that it's not toxic positivity, none of that. Mm -hmm. You're more like, yep. this is what I can do if that happens. So that your that energy gets to just flow through you. So mm -hmm. you get inspiration back. I think so often when we get stuck, we just spiral, we try to solve it or we try to you know press those emotions down. Mm -hmm. But that framework, I don't know what else to call it, but that idea of, okay, how could, what are anticipating what could happen? Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. It's kind of, it's so self-soothing. Mm -hmm. It's nice too, because then when you get to that moment, if you're not already in it, if you're kind of preemptively thinking of things, then all of your energy doesn't go towards coming up with the solutions. It goes to like almost coaching yourself through the solutions mm -hmm. that you then can just be like, huh, how do I feel about this? Because you're not thinking, oh my God, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? You're like, here's all the things I could do. What feels good? What feels easy? What feels fun? What do I need help with? Where do I need support? And then you get to do that. You don't have to come up with the stuff. I, I kind of think about, you know, haunted houses. Like, you know, we have screamers at Halloween. Those <laughs> crazy haunted houses. I'm not a fan of horror movies and haunted houses. But Me one neither. of the reasons, obviously, they're terrifying is like the jump scares, right? It's like things that come out of you at the dark and you're not expecting them. And that's when you get like, you shut down. Yes. You're like, huh, it's a thing. There's a scary <sighs> clown coming out of whatever. But if you turn the lights on in that place, it's not that scary because you can see things. You like you see the trap doors in the walls. You're like, I think something's gonna come out of there, and then it does. You're like, oh, I was right. So it's, to me, it's almost the same thing. You're you're almost you're deconstructing a haunted house. You're right. you're turning on the lights in the scary place, and then you can just deal with what's in front of you as opposed to what you think is around you. Yeah, what could come at you at any time. Oh my gosh, I love it all. And it re reminded me of a very funny story. I was in Universal Studios with my sister and we were riding the mummy. And she goes, oh, one. somebody's going to jump out. My friend told me that. And I was by the edge of the door. I'm like, you and the entire ride, I did not enjoy anything because I was like, somebody's going to come up. Some yeah. Nobody did. Nobody did. <laughs> and I just, I had to go to the gate, to the ride again, just so I can enjoy it. Because enjoy. I was in my own way, I was like, holy, oh, I was like bracing for the moment of impact. And my sister's like, mm -hmm. my friend told me that. I'm like, nobody came out. It, it was like the most horrifying five minutes of my life because my mind was like, ooh, yeah, mental. Yeah, it's a good ride though. I do enjoy that roller coaster. Yeah, it's a nice one. <laughs> Except for like, that just reminds me of how often sometimes I get in my own way and we do without mm -hmm. knowing. Mm -hmm. oh. Really? That was so good. So, so good. Thank you so we've much. We've talked about Pokemon. We've got roller coasters in here. I feel like we're running the gamut here. I think we are. I think we've juggled a lot of things, but we're also like, you know, letting it go back into the small world. I wanted to wrap this up with some rapid fire questions. Bring it. Okay. Huh. Pressure. Ready? Ready? I know. I always tell people like no pressure, the rapid fire, but no, no pressure. <laughs> What's the best compliment you've ever received? When someone tells me I'm cool, because I was always like that nerdy kid in school that like nobody wants to sit with me at lunch. So whenever when people have said like, oh, that's so cool or that's so cool that you've done that. I'm like, I'm, I'm cool. That's, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, OK, one thing that I forgot to mention is that Nikki, you speak how many languages? Four languages? Four. Yeah. Um, English, French. English, French, Spanish and Japanese. Japanese. Oh. <laughs> and you live See, in Japan. 
I lived in Japan. For, I lived in Japan. I studied it in Tokyo for a semester. That's amazing. Oh, and you also have so many different movie and stories references. When you were talking about your toolbox and all your experiences, I'm like, if you hang out with Nikki or even read the post, you will be so entertained because she, like the metaphors and the stories you connect. I mean, that's my language, so I vibe with it. I'm like, yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a nerd, like anime and comic books and just movie trivia. Like if we ever go to a trivia night and there's like pop culture movie trivia, I got this. We're good. <laughs> oh, gosh, I would love to watch you. My brain shuts off during any moment of pressure. So trivia night will not work for me. <laughs> um, a book that changed your life. I could go one of two ways with this. I would say like nonfiction probably um, crucial accountability. It's when I was working as a personal trainer and it, they, it was a book we had to read to have converse, you know, tough conversations with our clients. And I, I really liked that because it's about communicating accountability and ownership, but from a we space and not a me space, which I, which I really liked. But I would say um, fiction wise, I'm a huge romance novel fan. And the first romance novel I ever read was uh, Born in Ice by Nora Roberts. I think I was like 13. Um, and I love romance novels and that's just kind of, it's 90% it's of what I read. I probably read about five or 600 of them a year. Um, mm -hmm. so like, I don't know the whole romance genre. I just like, I really love, um, and I've loved it since that age. I love that you're so cultivating it too. It's important, <laughs> it's important to, to do more of what you love. <laughs> what does coming home to yourself mean? Mm. It's a hard one because I think I'm still constantly working on it but for, for a large part of my identity is my work and I'm, I'm a little too attached to it so I think any time that I can separate from my desk physically or mentally is a big one for me when I went to Australia two years ago there was literally like I think five days I didn't even have cell phone signal I was in the outback hiking and that was probably the most home type of feeling because it's just you it's just you in this big wide open space and it's a pretty harsh environment in a lot of places but to be so disconnected from the stuff I thought I had to be doing was like I, I don't consider myself a spiritual person pretty much at all but I will say that was probably the closest to like a spiritual awakening or spiritual moment that I've had in my entire life that's beautiful thank you for sharing mm -hmm. What would you like more of? Play. Yes. Mm -hmm. Advice for your younger self? Mm -hmm. I think it goes back to play. I would have told myself to play a lot more and not get so wrapped up in who I thought I had to be, but more so what I felt I needed to be in the future and, and not being in the now, just being so concerned with what's next, what's next, what's next, instead of just having fun in the now. Chill out a bit, Nikki, is what I would say to myself, <laughs> just chill. <laughs> Where can people find you? Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Nikki underscore McKnight, M-O-C, N-I-K-K-I underscore M-C-K-N-I-G-H-T, M-O-C. Uh, or you can find me online at my website at mcknightoc.com. Do you have any offers and programs? How can people get a piece of you? <laughs> I could do Ooh. work with you. Um, I do um, a lot of one-on-one -on -one work with um, online service-based entrepreneurs who are trying to streamline their business, fix up that back end, whether it's people, process, and planning. Um, and we do that in a variety of different ways. Um, so if you check out the website, you can find out a little bit more about those, but uh, yeah, I'm here to get results and get them quick. We're the, so this is not like a six month experience. This is a 30 day sprint. Cool. We're changing a lot of stuff in 30 days. And you'll have lots of fun with her. <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nikki. It's a pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening to the Whole and Unleashed podcast. What was your takeaway from today's conversation? Let me know in the comments or review. I would love to hear from you. Subscribe to get new episodes each week and visit wholeandunleashed.com for more information.